Well, we're here with John Saunders from my NYC CNC, right? The YouTube channel. And uh, you got a new VM3. Yep. And you came out today and you were checking out the factory. And we had a couple questions. We were just going to have a conversation. Our story is I'm a self taught machinist and I absolutely love metalworking, but so much of what I learned has been through YouTube or internet forums. So sometimes it's not just trying to figure out what's the right information, what's the right path to go down. And I will say it's a lot easier now than it was eight, 10 years ago. There's so many awesome resources out there, but I spent years kind of thinking about what I get a bigger machine. We, we use smaller machines today. And so for me buying the VM3 was a huge step up, like super excited about it. But I spent two years trying to think about it and research it, what was the right fit for us. And um, I had now, I always think, how can I pay it forward? How can I help other people, who people that are in my shoes that are trying to do this? So I learned a ton of things that I thought I would share some notes on of, about buying the machine, about getting it set up. And then maybe you can tell me what you think is, what are good points, what are things that aren't as baby as important as I think they are. Oh yeah. Talk yeah. about it? Oh yeah, for sure. So yeah, anything you got. Um, so one of things I realized, too late in the game was our floor only has a five inch concrete slab. So I think the spec says six inch. I've heard so many people say sort of a don't worry about it and concrete gets stronger with age and it, it you know, matters whether you've got a good subsurface. I guess my point would be if you're ever thinking about it, figure out what you can do. You know, so many people are gonna be in rented facilities. So just at least try to know what you have and then recognize um, these these things aren't perfect. Like they they will move based on the pad below you, and forklifts that drive in front of you can can induce what do you call it? induce stress in the castings and change sure. your tram. Yeah, it, you know, um, there's so much debate about that. If you talk to a facilities manager, yeah. they're gonna say, oh, it's all fine, it's perfect, whatever. I'm as a machinist, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not fine. Right. I really try not to split the slabs. I know everyone okay. hates this, but I I don't trust it because I've had forklifts drive by and had one side of the slab move by. 25 thou and the other side move five thou yeah and i just don't like it right. it's gonna how can that not affect your part right. and it totally can affect the machine if it's rocking back and forth yeah right so when you say split the slab if you've got six feet you try to get all six on one between one saw cut yeah it's just always just always a good idea it's yeah. not always possible we don't live in a perfect world right. right but it sure makes a difference we've got a train and uh here in the afternoon you're going to hear it and you're going to hear the train go by. Not only that, but the floor is going to shake under our feet. Under Seriously? this corner of the building because the train runs outside. Wow. And we've gone to customers before out in the field that have had surface finish issues. Only every once in a while. <laughs> and then sure enough, they, yeah. the guy comes out for the fifth time, and that's when the train comes by. That's hilarious. Yeah. So I just took a class on hand scraping, and we did this test where we put a tense indicator on a slab, a granite slab, and we were all s circled around it. We zeroed it out. And then everybody walked to one side of the granite slab and we watched that indicator move a few tenths. Proof <laughs> that like on a regular floor, just five or 10 people, thousand pounds can cause crazy, right? Yeah. Um, so kind of my lesson learned because I was so excited to set up this great machine and we've been making great parts. I'm super happy with it. But it's also one of those things where it's not like you're gonna have zero tenths and zero tenths run out of all extreme corners of it just out the gate. You know, So we've been talking to our HFO about maybe getting it laser leveled, maybe coming back and checking after the machine is settled with the slab and, and just learning six months down the road. Is that something that makes sense to do? It can be. For, for most of our machines, it's, it shouldn't be the end of the world. As long okay. as you're sitting on one slab that you're not seeing yeah. any great big differences. The machines are kind of self-contained within their own casting a yeah. little bit, right? Yeah. So they're, they're going to hold themselves together. Yeah. It's just that, you know, you just can't have forklifts, like you said, running down the aisle. Right, right. Uh, you know, because they'll affect the part. They can. Yeah. Water quality. I, I'm in southern Ohio, and I actually got our water tested. I paid to have it tested at first, and then I oh, later, learned my, later learned that my coolant company would do it for free. Um, so if you're if you have a relationship, and that's another thing, it's getting relationships with people has been hugely helpful for us. Tooling, software, uh, work holding, and coolant. They test your coolant for free or your water quality. Um, but, so we put in a RO system. We did it ourselves. Not that expensive. Right? It runs into our Haas auto coolant top off, that's uh -huh. what you call it, which yeah. is great. Um, but coolant, uh, water quality, matter. you actually did a video on it where you talk about how with hard water, which has fancy word for saying it has a bunch of minerals, the water evaporates, leaving the minerals behind, so it gets harder over time. Exactly, it just gets worse and worse. Yeah. In, in the Midwest, and it depends on where you're at, the, the water can be worse. Um, I was mentioning this to you earlier that I was at a facility there in Southern Michigan that the water yeah. was so bad 
that it would actually take totes of um, totes of uh, good water from the next town over, oh, hilarious. fill up the truck, <laughs> just Move. to fill up that machine. Right. Because we didn't have a, a, a water system. But I could yeah. tell just by running the, the raw water out of the tap with mm -hmm. my, refract my refractometer, I was at 4% and I hadn't even mixed my coolant yet. Are you serious? Yeah, it was oh my God. horrible water. Oh, and wow. the next town over, I was at zero. So, I, so even if wow. you have um, hard water, you've got to recalibrate and run your coolant mixture at 12% instead of eight, yeah. if you yeah. account for that 4% hard water, or whatever silliness there. So you right. want to re-zero it on the, on the water that's coming out of the, that you're using out of the tap. Right, interesting. Yeah. So, so for me, it's that, it's that new toy syndrome. You know, yeah. this BM3 for me is so, I, you know, I saved it for so long, it's so special. Like I don't want it to get damaged or hurt. And so my fear is I'm all of a sudden just gonna rust the machine out because I have really bad water. So the RO system wasn't expensive. We just bought a home type or fairly co really common for folks that run fish tanks. Nothing expensive, crazy. And that gives me, should give me great water. Um, doing, paying attention to my coolant levels. And I, I actually think I'll be pretty good. Like I'm not worried about it anymore. Yeah. Um, do you, what do you, what would you say to me about rust preventatives? Like when I go to put a vice down on the mill table? You know, it's funny. I have to look at the model number. We've got our RP, which is actually, it's actually labeled here RP. Okay. We use a casserole rust preventative. Yeah. And, um, and I'll almost always put something down the table if it's going to be sitting there for any amount of time. Um, if you're a couple weeks? A couple weeks for sure. Okay. Yeah. If, if it's a normal shop and I'm changing the vice out a couple times a week, yep. then I don't even, I just put it on dry. I don't worry about it. Got the it. coolant will work its way in. But um, if a fixture is going down for any amount of time, um, yeah, an RP Just would spray be nice. some RP yeah. on both the table and the. Yeah, device. yeah, and real thin. You don't want the thing floating, but. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely something on there because it, it might stay on there a long time. Yeah, right. How often in a perfect world, like let's say I think I, like with our setup, I'm hoping I can leave my vices kind yeah. of in there. I'm kind of building yeah. our workflow around that semi permanent system. In a perfect world, should I still every three months pull them off, clean the table, all that? It might be a good idea. See, that's different because you own the equipment. And typically in the you know, job shop environment, you just let it sit on there forever. If it gets rust, it's going to be a surface rust. You can always scotch bright it off. Scotch bright off. You definitely don't have, if it's so thick that you have to stone it off, something has been terri has gone yeah. terribly wrong. Got it. Um, but a little bit of scotch you know, bright pad is, right. is not a big deal. It'll no come deal. right off. Cool. But um, even on our coolant, that's a big problem. People will run their coolant too light. And you got to run at least four, five, six percent okay. to to keep the rust, you know, prevention properties of the coolant working. Yeah, so that's the the band of the band of coolant is too light or too low of bricks means you can rust. Yeah. Too high means it's going to go bad. The infamous skunky coolant. I don't know. I said, I, no? I, I, I want to run it as high as possible. Now it's too expensive. Really? I'm not paying for it. Yeah. But as far as cutting the parts, if I'm running between eight and ten percent, I'm very happy. Okay. Because um, my parts tend to get better surface finishes, especially on aluminum That's um, interesting. With, a, with a higher coolant concentration. You were saying that at lunch today. Yeah. I'm trying to get a reamer dialed in and I, you know, I'm a self-taught machinist. Some things I do great, some things I kind of yeah. fumble around with and I'm like, why am I not getting a better reamed finish? And you said, hey, try bumping your bricks up. 2%. Definitely, def yeah. And you can do a test, right? So you can, yeah. you can, you can always water it down, but yeah. bump up that coolant concentration a little bit, see what that surface finish looks like. That's and if it, if it works, it works. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, I spent a lot of time, you know, being the first purchase, going, through, uh, being our first BMC, looking at what options were important. And I was actually talking to my HFO, and they said it best when they were like, "Focus on stuff that you can't do later." So non-field upgradable options. It was so obvious. I just you get paralyzed by analysis, and then yeah. it's overwhelming. And so for me, I went with the 15K spindle. We cut so much aluminum, it just seemed like a no-brainer. Uh, and then I went with the bigger ATC, which. I'm glad that we did. I'm starting to realize that if you get a dedicated machine, you don't need all those tool positions, but it's really nice to have all of your tools. We've got a chip fan, we've got our probe, the steel, aluminum. It, it is really nice. Yeah, and just leave it loaded. So yeah. for the versatility of a job shop, that helps. Right, it does, exactly, right. So uh, if, you, if you only had two options, three options, mm -hmm. what would you buy? Oh, three options on the whole Haas machine? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, Oh, so for our VM3, are you calling the Renishaw an option? Yeah. Oh sure. my gosh. Yeah, Ren you have okay, to buy the probe. See, that's, that's what, it's funny because that's what I'm getting at. We'll yeah. talk about this because I'm I'm the button pusher, the machinist. But I've I've said it a few times to these guys. The the, the probing, I just you I have a hard like time. It. No, I have a hard time living without it. Now. Oh yeah. I mean, I could. I can talk my boss into that. We're not, you know, Mark did a really cool video showing how you can use a test indicator and an insert to find the edge of your part. I don't need the probe to find the edge of my part. I need the probe to do all the other stuff that we're doing now, like mid-routine checking and calibration and work coordinate offset and shifting in G68. It's amazing. Yeah. 
the, the, the probing, I'll say it again. The two options I want are probing and TSC. TSC is different. Yeah. Most of my parts I can run just fine with uh, flood coolant. But there's always that one deep hole or that one whatever, that one tool that I can't, where the TSC has just been a lifesaver. So, so, so you use TSC more, you care more about it for uh, drills or for things like indexable end mills or indexable face mills? Well, I used to think that I wanted it for the drills, but now we just ran a test part earlier. Right. I couldn't have run that. You know, you can run that thing at three, four hundred inches a minute uh, with with TSC. I can't it's do that with flood coolant. So that was a one inch or yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, thirty-two millimeter, inch and a quarter, and yep. I'll run it three hundred inches a minute all day long. But I don't know what I'd run that on if I was just running flood coolant. Um, yeah, I don't think I could do that. Maybe two hundred. It was minute. amazing. Yeah. I don't know if we can like splice footage into that, but it was it's turning out beautiful, even though it's a roughing operation yeah. in aluminum, 200 thou depth of cut or something, 100 yeah. some thou, and it was cooking. Yeah, no, I, I've become a uh, pretty spoiled with yeah, the TSC. TSC. And that's 300 PSI? That's just, yeah, that's 300 PSI, so it's, yeah. it's not that awesome. Man, that's a tough question though. Yeah, TSC is, is huge, and what else would I get? The extra spindle RPM, but see, that depends on what kind of parts you're running. Yeah, exactly, and the truth is that, I like that, but it's not, it doesn't stop me from making great parts. I could still make great parts with the 12,000 RPM, spin, which I, th I think is what yeah. the DM3 base is. Yeah, that's not the, uh, I'm not trying to shave two seconds off yeah. at all. Yeah, and so sometimes with like um, some long holes, if you got some six inch long mm -hmm. hole that's, you know, whatever, 316th down, you can drill that just fine. You can peck drill that with flood coolant, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're gonna, you're just gonna pay for it if you don't have TSC eventually. Right. It's, it's just, the job becomes not um, productive. You, you know, you're not making as much money on this thing mm -hmm. without the TSC. TSC pays for itself pretty quick. But that's the funny thing too. People focus so much on shaving two seconds off and a cycle time. And for a shop like me, we're tiny. I actually care a lot more about not shaving a few seconds off a cycle time. I care more about figuring out how to get my machine running from 6 a.m. till midnight or even overnight. Yeah. So that's what we just started doing. Was, saving your time. Yeah. Personally. Well, who cares about the three seconds? I care more about the 24 hours in a day. Because right now our machine has never been running between midnight and 6 a.m. And so why not? It's not because of software. It's not because of, we have the demand for the work. It's because I don't have a way right now to close that loop of a solution to load parts in or do something like that, which which I, I want to figure out. Yeah, just keep the machine going. Right. The spindle's got to be got to be turned. Spindle's got to be turned, and and it's funny because uh, you've said it, and a few other people have as well. You know, we've got the solenoids in the back of the machine, or the relays, yeah, the M code relays, M code sure. relays. So I actually can integrate with like an Arduino, and if I can build the mechanics to get parts into the machine, we could not only could we run it, but you could do what you do, pneumatic or hydraulic sure. work holding. Mm -hmm. uh, we could do on the Renishaw OTS. We could be doing tool checking to make sure. We're being smart about it. I already get, it's funny, I'm in California, so it's, we start our sh shift at 6 a.m. and at 3 a.m. I got a Haas alert text that the guys had turned the machine on. Was, oh, time change. <laughs> yeah, time change. So that was great to wake up at 3 a.m. because I saw an alert on the Haas. <laughs> Luckily, it's just that it was being turned on, but that's crazy. That's you know, text good. message alert, it's cool. Uh, I'm really glad, you know, I started all this process a while back. Um, IMTS, I went, not expecting to get as much out of it as I did. Um, I saw Haas, you had so many machines there, All the other manufacturers did as well. And it was great because it was a little bit, I guess everybody probably runs their trade shows in a pretty like, hey, we've got this dialed in to show you what we want. But nevertheless, it's finally a chance under one room to walk between all these different machines and evaluate it and talk to it, talk to other customers. Uh, I would say really encourage that if somebody's looking at your next step up. Um, I found that better than just going to a, a, a demo day of, of with one machine or one customer. Yeah, it's kind of, you're able to see, you know, whatever was out there. Mm -hmm. and it was kind of a funny thing, actually at IMTS last year, we had our service van there, which was a, which was a unique thing. You don't often see the service van in a booth at a trade show. Right. But really, that's that's a big part of the experience, is, is can you get a service guy there? Do you have to fly somebody out from right. Chicago, or can you call up some local dealer and have them support you? And so I did that too. I hit the phones. I called, a, I don't know, three or four different factories in our, area that have machines and I asked them about the relationship with this 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 person and then I found the, the small shop the job shops and uh, it's funny because it's it's so hard to think about it but everything mechanical will break at some point or will have some sort of problem so it's really a question of how affordable is it how responsive are they can they get you the part um, and I heard a couple of scary stories of like eight weeks 
of downtime to get a part Some in. Some special part. Yeah, I couldn't, I, and, and, it, and it hit me then, but where it really has hit me now is I'm realizing, like right now, we've been running our machine so much, I really don't want someone to tell me your machine needs to be down for a full day, let alone, because <laughs> I've only got one machine. You know, I can't, like that's really brutal. Uh, I told you this morning, like, we're a really small shop. One of the things that is cool is we've never ever missed a deadline. But what do I do if, if my, the one machine I can use to make that part goes down and I don't have good service, yeah. there's nothing I can do about it. I, I guess I call another shop. Yeah, most of the parts that uh, a Hostech needs to fix your machine is, is already in his truck. Yeah. And if he does need something, it's probably back at the office. Or yep. worst case scenario, it'll be there in the morning. Yeah, so I don't know what to say. I haven't, I haven't had that experience <laughs> yet, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, no, but you guys were great. It was uh, really cool to see the machine get delivered. We did a video on it, unpacking it and rigging it in getting it all set up. There were a lot more boxes, if that's one other silly thing I can say. When you get a new VMC, you've got a lot of wood and boxes to deal with when you're all done. Uh, I just want to, of course, run the machine. I realized we got to we got to get all this cleaned up. That was cool, though. A lot that's of grease good. to take off the table. So what was the, what's the biggest um, thing you've come across? What's different about running this size machine compared to the machines you were running before? Uh, recognizing you've got to take advantage of the machine. So. I've traditionally done one, maybe two vices, single stations. We're now running four dual stations. So it's eight parts at a time, which is a big step up. Um, but then it's also trying to stay lean. So like I just did a job, actually it's cool. It was the first job shop job on the Haas that the customer let us film it. We haven't released the video yet, but hopefully in the next few weeks. And rather than do, we just did two stations. It was only a hundred, or two vices, it was a hundred yeah. parts. But rather than make four of, of, of side one, we did uh, full, two of side one, two of side two. So every time we open the doors, we pulled two f finished parts off, which helps you avoid a downstream mistake you didn't realize. Yeah, so you got a finished part. Yeah, that's one problem with doing it in all one operation. The, the old way was that you, you, if you find a problem at the end, it's too late yeah. to fix it. Right. Even right. then, we were just talking about this part. We got a demo set up here, and it was set up for a trade show a little bit different. And as soon as you walked up, you're like, yeah, but you ran all this left side instead of the right side. Yeah, yeah. And by combining the two and spending a few minutes, you can save all those extra tool right. changes. Right. Why did the half inch end mill finish this part and then do a tool change? Why didn't yep. it go and run the, uh, the other operation on the second op? So by combining that first op and second op, you save all those tool changes on common tools. Yep. Which is a big deal. Huge, huge deal. Yeah. Especially because, you know, I love the VM3, but it's not, I, I intentionally chose not to get like the 4SS. Yeah. I wanted the VM3. So it's a little bit slower and it's got that 26 inches to get up to do the tool changes. So when I can stay down and do work on multiple parts, it's, it's, it is huge. I, I hate to say it, I'm already realizing how important it is to get that machine making chips yeah. and keep making chips. Yeah. And the more parts you run on the table, of course, the less it matters right. your tool change time. But right. you have to make advantage. That you take advantage. You have to you have to fill the table or at least combine the the tool changes. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it's cool. It works. Yeah, just it's basics, amazing. but it's not. You have to think about yeah. it. Every single every single part. Right. Yeah, a little bit learning to also learning about how, you know, I ran machines for eight years basically taking one thou per two. That was mm -hmm. my just you know, changing the RPM or service feet per minute, but it was one thou per two. Yeah. And it worked great. I have no complaint. But now it's like, wait a minute here. I can go Four thou, six thou, twenty thou, <laughs> yeah, and then realizing well you can, but you've got to think about not only your work holding, but we were doing some parts where we were interpolating out a big hole. Well, guess what? When you've got ten thousand pounds on a vice, once you blow that hole out in the middle, it's you no longer round. Perhaps if you it depends on how you've held it. Yeah, but you got to think about that. What what's and how important is that? Have you changed the clamping tolerance? Does it change the order of operations? Uh, it's it's good. It's fun. I like. It gets me excited. But you got to think about it. There's a lot. There's a lot. So you've got this new VM3. What what are you excited about? What are you what are you looking forward to getting back to your shop and uh, playing with? So we finally got all the vices set up and we're running all of our parts and it's been no problem. But we've changed some of our work holding and what I've been doing recently. But I was only doing it with one large part and now oh. I want to do it with multiple. But is this probing? Like not just probing. I was using the probe, which is great. Yeah. Or you find the center of your part, find the corner of your part, find the Z height. I'm now realizing this is so cool that I can do two things. One is I can do probing updates midstream. So in the middle of my program, if like if I have a mushroom top and I've exposed it or decked it off, I can now probe the part to update off of a bore. It's changed how you have to tolerance a part because if I can find a bore that's already been accurate and, and I don't need to worry about the OD that may not have been that accurate, probe off that. Um, and then the second thing is, is G68. G68 has to be 
I don't know how you explain G68. You spin the world around any point you want, but if yes. you got the probe, Amazing. you have this perfect location to, to yes. rotate around every time. Amazing. Basically, I still train my vices in, but you can update for, you can make perfect parts. It's been huge for me. So maybe we can do a video on, well, so that's my question is how do I do more with G68? How do I incorporate it in? What, am I, what do I not know? I have to think there's so much I don't know about using the Renishaw probes beyond the traditional find your, the VPS, you know, find your bore, find your block center. So let's, let's go. Anything, anything. We can do anything. Okay. I like it. Let's do it. Let's hey, do thanks it. for having me out though. It was really cool. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Yeah.